Hello and welcome to a webinar hosted by the Collaborative Conservation and Adaptation Strategy Toolbox or CCAST. My name is Dina Morrell and I'm a program analyst for the Bureau of Reclamation and I'm based in Las Vegas, Nevada. And I've been part of the CCAST team since 2018. CCAST is intended to support landscape scale conservation and restoration by enhancing issue-based peer-to-peer -peer knowledge exchange through the development of case studies, workshops, and webinars like today's. We will use case studies, workshops, and webinars as a foundation for communities of practice to address drought adaptation, which will be the focus of today's webinar, but also for grassland restoration and introduced aquatic species. If you would like more information on CCAST or our communities of practice, please feel free to email me or Anna Weinberg, who is also with us today, and we'll put our emails in the chat. And with that, I'll turn it over to Anna. Thanks, Tina. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Anna Weinberg, and I work with the CCAST team at the University of Arizona, based in Tucson. Um, I joined CCAST a year ago as the coordinator of the Draw Adaptation Community of Practice. So today we are hosting a presentation from Barney Austin. He will discuss how drought contingency planning in the Arbuckle Simpson Aquifer helped the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma and the Chickasaw Nation prepare for and respond for drought conditions, the critical role of tribal nations, and the lessons learned that are transferable to other drought response efforts across the nation. Barney Austin is the president and CEO of Aqua Strategies, a water resources engineering firm based out of Austin, Texas. He has worked on water resources planning issues in Texas and Oklahoma for over 20 years and was the former director of the Surface Water Resources Division of the Texas Water Development Board until 2009. In addition to consulting for the Choctaw and Chickasaw Nations in Oklahoma, he's an adjunct professor at both East Central and Oklahoma State Universities. A final reminder before turning it over to Barney, if you have questions during the presentation, please enter them in the chat box and I will re relay them to our speaker afterwards. With that, Barney, we are ready for you. Great, thank you, Anna. Um, so you've heard about me. I wanted to give, uh, give a quick shout out to uh, a couple of folks from the Chickasaw Nation who are on the call, April Taylor. Um, has joined us and also Chalem Hogue, and they've both been involved in both the draft contingency plan and, and implementation of those recommendations. So uh, hopefully they'll be involved in the Q&A period afterwards. I also noticed a fellow Texan in John Nielsen Gammon. So it's great to have our state climatologist on here. He, he's uh, a lot smarter than me on, on climate and drought issues. So he may be answering questions too. But with that, let me get started. Um, <clears throat> So the Arbuckle Simpson Aquifer is um, karst limestone and sandstone aquifer uh, in South Central Oklahoma, um, and it's a it's a very plurif plurific, prolific sorry uh, aquifer. Lots of springs, lots of clear streams emanating from it. Um, really diverse and interesting ecology and, and rec recreational activities uh, associated with that. It's a really important. Uh, feature uh, for the state. Um, it's also uh, the principal and, so, well, and sometimes sole source of water for about 150,000 people uh, in the south central part of the state. Um, so from a water supply perspective, it's very important. And those water suppliers are either drawing water directly from the aquifer <clears throat> or drawing water from the streams and rivers that emanate from the aquifer. So either way, they're drawing on that water either directly or indirectly uh, for water supply purposes. But in, in, uh, in uh, 2003, Senate Bill 288 passed uh, and effectively reduced the equal proportionate share of the aquifer by 90%. So just, just to explain what that means exactly, for aquifers that have not been studied in Oklahoma, there is what we call an equal proportionate share. So if you have one acre of land, you can draw out of that aquifer two acre feet uh, of water per year. Uh, and the, so the default number is two acre feet per acre for aquifers in Oklahoma that, like I said, have not been studied. The Arbuckle Simpson also had that designation as well, a two acre feet per acre. Um, but after a, 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 a lengthy and expensive study of the aquifer by the USGS and others, uh, that number was reduced to 0.2 uh, 
acre feet per acre. Um, so uh, uh, effectively reduced it by 90%. Um, and of course, it was reduced in recognition of the importance of streams and springs uh, emanating from the aquifer and also the critical role that it provides uh, to the region, uh, not only for water supply, but for recreation and the ecology of the region. So if you haven't been to the region, it's, it's really, really pretty. Um, Arbuckle Lake uh, is actually a Bureau of Reclamation uh, reservoir, but that's a big tourist uh, destination. The Blue River is the biggest river that emanates from the aquifer. So it's a spring fed river that is stocked with trout, which is um, unusual for, for Oklahoma, as you'd imagine. Um, has lots of recreational activities associated with it, uh, all the way from the headwaters down to the Durant area. And then there's a large number of springs as well. Um, the, the Chickasaw uh, National Recreational Area uh, sort of encompasses this large area of springs uh, near Sulphur, Oklahoma. And the Chickasaw Nation have invested a lot of money uh, in the region. This was a, uh, a dilapidated hotel that had been abandoned uh, many years ago that the Chickasaw Nations took over and rebuilt using the same archeological style that, um, architectural style that it was first built in. Uh, and that helps bring tourists uh, to the region, of course. Um, and like I said, the Chickasaw National Recreational Area uh, surrounds Arbuckle Lake. Um, and I, I was actually there just yesterday uh, and the day before, and there's, it's just a lovely area to be with hike and bike trails and springs and waterfalls and swimming pools, natural swimming pools and things like that. So it draws a lot of uh, tourists to the area. And the, the economic impact of that travel is, is pretty significant to an area that doesn't have a lot of industry and a lot of other uh, um, revenue generating opportunities. Uh, some oil and gas, of course, but tourism is the number one industry in Oklahoma, sorry, number three industry in Oklahoma and probably the number one industry in Southeast Oklahoma, Southeast and South Central Oklahoma. So it's a big deal. But the reason we're talking about drought contingency plans um, is, uh, I'm sure you're not surprised because of a fairly significant drought that occurred uh, at the, um, I guess started more or less 10 years ago uh, in the region, reduced rainfall, higher temperatures. It's a drought that impacted Texas and other South Central states as well. Um, we had, uh, uh, in Texas, we had the hottest, um, and driest, driest by precipitation uh, year in 2011 that we'd ever experienced before. Um, and that was similar up in Oklahoma. And this is for the South Central Climate Division showing precipitation. And in that period of time, starting in about 2010, there was uh, quite a bit less rainfall and quite a bit, uh, or quite higher temperatures as well. But you don't necessarily see that in a regional uh, precipitation estimate like in this figure. And so, you know, we water resources managers often rely on other indicators like the Palmer Drought Severity Index, um, which is estimated from uh, weather station data, but is meant to be a surrogate of, of soil moisture. And when you look on this figure, um, you know, we got down into an extreme drought situation um, during that time, uh, which we've only had three or four times over the last hundred years. It, the other interesting thing about this recent drought is it's come on the tail end of a really significantly wet period over the last about three decades. Uh, it's been much wetter than usual. And so, you know, most people had forgotten about the, the previous uh, extreme drought. So it hit folks, I think, a lot harder uh, than it would have otherwise. So if you look at water uses over the aquifer, um, you know, there's a lot of public water supply. In fact, that's the, the majority of those uses. I'm showing water permits rather than actual water usage. It's easier to quantify that, um, especially up here in Oklahoma, but public water supply is more than 50% of the use. There is a little bit of irrigation. Uh, but not, not, too, not too much. Uh, a lot of dryland farming, a um, little, little bit of irrigation, both from, ground, from the groundwater directly from the aquifer and also from surface water sources that, again, emanate from the aquifer. Um, very little industrial use, a little bit of use for the power industry, uh, a, a significant amount of water use for the recreational and wildlife industry. Um, 
and then a, a piece of the pie for the mining industry, uh, mainly for washing gravel. I'm gonna talk about the mining industry a little bit uh, more later. So the, the water providers uh, across the region, I know it's a little bit different in every state, but uh, we have a lot of rural water districts and a lot of cities that have responsibilities um, to provide water. The rural water districts tend to have a large footprint, long, long pipelines delivering water to remote rural areas. Uh, and then the cities are typically distributing water uh, inside of their ETJs. Um, but some of the biggest water users uh, are some of the smallest polygons on this figure. So Durant's a big water user and Ada's a big water user. Ada being at the top middle part of this figure and, and Durant being in the lower uh, or the southern southeastern corner uh, there of your map. Both of those areas incidentally are growing very fast. And both of those areas are growing fast in large part because of tribal activities in the region. Both have a uh, significant commercial interest, not just gaming, but other commercial interests in the area and have plowed a lot of money both back into the cities themselves, but into the community as a whole. But another interesting thing that's going on in the region is um, there's a lot of mining activities and that, that mining consists of limestone mining for, for cement and building construction, but also consists of uh, sandstone mining for uh, the fracking industry and also for chip production. Uh, the sand is apparently of super high quality uh, and suitable for all kinds of applications. It's very desirable and, and it's worth a lot of money. So there's a lot of uh, open pit mining activities that do have an impact we think on the aquifer, but quantifying that impact is, is somewhat difficult. So those large open pit mines can act like very large wells and when mining activities are ongoing in those uh, open pit mines, they're having to pump that water out of, out of the open pit and typically into a neighboring stream. So there's some interesting water balance things going on related to the mining, uh, mining activities. But if you look at um, the impact uh, of drought across the region, um, uh, cities like Durant, for example, city of Durant, uh, as big as it is, um, has uh, the Blue River as its sole source of water. And during that drought, um, the river ran almost completely dry. Um, of course, that's below the intake, of course, but uh, uh, they were within about one CFS of no longer being able to uh, divert the amount of water that they need. Um, and that has that, that caused uh, <laughs> caused a lot of concerns, as you might imagine. It's one thing for a you know a, a little town with a population of fifty or so to run out of water; they can truck that water in. But for a large city like uh, Durant, um, issue. Um, Tishomingo in a, serious, in a similar situation relies on Pennington Creek, which also emanates from the Arbuckle Simpson. And their, uh, their creek uh, almost ran dry as well. And that's a sole source of water for Tishomingo. Um, for, the, for the towns of Bromide and Wapanaka, the, the springs went dry. Uh, Bromide almost lost their, the only well that they have for providing water to the city. Uh, Birds Mill Spring uh, in Ada, uh, was discharging at a historically low level, which is a good indication of how bad the drought was. Lake of the Arbuckles in the, re in the region I showed you on that map had levels as low as anyone had ever seen before. Um, and in the Chickasaw National Recreation Area, as I mentioned, is a large uh, tourist destination. Springs went dry. In fact, they had to close uh, some of the uh, public swimming holes due to um, uh, uh, concerns uh, related to um, health and safety of being in those in those springs that weren't flowing or bringing in those pools that weren't receiving fresh water. You know, economically, there's a lot of information out there and it's a little bit difficult to quantify and, and do an apples to apples comparison. But, um, you know, on the on the ag industry, there isn't a lot of tilled, um, uh, you know, irrigated farming out there but there is a lot of ranching and uh, a lot of ranchers had to sell their stock um, 
uh, before it, <laughs> before desirable because they just didn't have enough forage or pond stock ponds were running dry and things like that. So there were economic consequences as a result of that. It was also because of the heat and the drought, uh, dry conditions, lots of forest fires that occurred in the area. Uh, so those damages have been estimated uh, at $130 million. And, uh, you know, to, uh, the, the Blue River and the National Recreation Area being big tourist draws to the area, the impact to the tour tourism industry was, was really large as well. So those, those are the reasons that the, uh, this drought contingency plan came about. And uh, we applied for it in 2015, just before the huge floods came to the area, like I was talking about before. Uh, but we were successful in getting funding from the Bureau of Reclamation uh, through their Water Smart Drought Response uh, Grant Program. Um, these, these drought contingency plans, um, and I'm, I'm assuming most people or everyone on the phone on the call probably are familiar with what they are, but they're, they're stakeholder driven um, and they target not just one sector, but all sectors that have an interest uh, or are impacted by drought. So we targeted uh, water providers, the tourism slash recreation industry, private landowners, large ranchers, um, the ag industry, uh, oil and gas, as well as mining uh, industry, uh, local and state government were involved in this as well. Um, and so we brought all of those folks uh, together to help make sure that we had identified all drought vulnerabilities uh, across the region, not just to water suppliers, but the ag industry, like I said, and all of those other se sectors. And uh, ultimately, the main purpose of the, these drought contingency plan activities is to identify strategies um, to mitigate future droughts. Uh, and also, in this particular case, um, increasing aquifer sustainability. So how do we keep this aquifer as beneficial to the region in the future as it is right now? And an important factor, um, or an important success factor, I should say, for this activity in Oklahoma is that it be non-regulatory. And so we were very upfront um, right from the beginning, telling stakeholders that this is not something, we were not developing rules that would be imposed on them. There were no regulatory actions that would occur as a result of this, but this was planning activities to help mitigate the impacts of drought in the future um, to the region. So, um, the, you know, as, as uh, suggested by the Bureau of Reclamation for these uh, drought planning activities, we had uh, structured uh, input from stakeholders. So we formed a, uh, what we called a drought contingency plan task force, uh, composed primarily of the uh, folks that had a stronger um, connection or a stronger desire to do something about drought mitigation. Um, and then we had an advisory group made up of representatives from all of those sectors, uh, ag sector, uh, academic sector for bringing technical support, um, uh, all, all types of folks, including the South Central Climate Science Center uh, with which the Chickasaw Nation has a, uh, uh, is a partner uh, in, that, in, that, in that role. Um, we also uh, just made sure that we reached out to other stakeholder groups. And even if they weren't willing to participate in regular meetings, we wanted to make sure we reached out to them and got some input from them uh, on this particular activity and, and made sure that their voices were heard. But uh, the overall um, responsibility for um, conducting this activity and, and developing the report and implementing the findings was on the planning team which was made up of the Chickasaw Nation, the Choctaw Nation, uh, uh, my company and a, um, a consultant, Dwayne Smith, who happens to be the former director of the Oklahoma Water Resources Board. Um, what I should have mentioned is that the aquifer, I think is entirely within the Chickasaw Nation's jurisdictional area. Um, but some of those streams, uh, including the Blue River flow into Choctaw uh, territory. So the city of Durant is 
lies squarely within Choctaw territory. So the, Chicas uh, the Choctaw Nation have a strong vested interest in the success of this program and, and they were part of our planning team. So back to the um, uh, meetings themselves, we had seven meetings that were facilitated by the uh, Chickasaw Nation um, to, to sort of uh, describe activities, garner input from those folks and start developing uh, strategies. We also visited um, with all of those individual water providers that rely on water from the Arbuckle Simpson um, Aquifer. Uh, to make sure even though they're participating in some of these group meetings we wanted to make sure that they had a, a an opportunity one-on-one -on -one to provide some input uh, on us and i'm going to talk about this a little bit later but our our plan was completed in late uh 2017. so uh, there's there and there's in that report that i'm talking about i think i think it was 197 pages long so there's an awful lot of information in there including a lot of data that uh, some of you might find uh, particularly interesting. But I wanted to highlight some of the, maybe perhaps some of the more interesting findings or some of the findings that kind of summarize the overall um, thought process that we had going on. So when we spoke with uh, water providers across the region and asked them about their vulnerability to drought, you know, in this, in this last drought, which was very fresh in their minds, what were their main vulnerabilities? Um, a lot of them, uh, in, in fact, most of them, uh, 13 out of the 16, I think, um, identified um, as just a lack of supply being a main vulnerability. Their wells were running dry or lake levels were low or streams are running low. Um, and so there, there had genuine and real concerns related to the amount of water that they had available and their ability to deliver water to their uh, customers. But a lot of the concerns that they had um, with their water distribution systems that, and which were exacerbated by drought um, had to do with their existing infrastructure. Um, and sometimes that was an emergency supply or an emergency connection to a, 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 an adjacent regional uh, rural water district or town or something, or, or perhaps sometimes it had to do with just dilapidated infrastructure like a water treatment plant or a well. Um, and those were concerns that they had um, on a day-to-day -day basis that were exacerbated during drought conditions. Many of them uh, expressed concerns about the rapid growth in some parts uh, of this region. So Durant, like I said, is growing rapidly. Ada is growing rapidly. And some other parts of this region are growing rapid, rapidly as well. And, and just being able to keep up, making sure they have enough water available um, and have the infrastructure to, to deliver that water was a major concern. As a result of the Senate Bill 288 that I talked about before, some of these water providers are out of compliance. In other words, they needed to acquire or need to acquire additional water rights in order to be able to pump water from the aquifer. And so some of those um, water providers had that as the main concern. Um, that's a whole other topic I'd be happy to talk about uh, some other time, but that's an interesting feature of this particular region. So um, on, the, on the development of uh, drought mitigation and response strategies, as you'd expect, they've been developed uh, in large part to address their vulnerabilities. So uh, infrastructure uh, played a big part, whether they needed to drill more wells or uh, put in additional um, diversion structures on rivers or impoundments in order to be able to divert water. Um, those featured fairly prominently amongst those water management strategies, uh, drought mitigation strategies, I should say. Uh, groundwater development, which is typically, typically drilling new wells. Um, the development, in some cases, these folks didn't have conservation plans or drought plans. So, you know, six or seven of these entities uh, listed that as something that they needed to do as soon as possible. Um, Management of leaks, as you can as you can imagine, is a is a big deal in some of these areas. Some of these water providers, although I'm not I'm not 100 sure of the water providers over the Arbuckle Simpson, but certainly in this part of the state, some of those water providers have leak rates that are unaccounted for water rates that are approaching or greater than 50 percent. So that's a that's a big issue in some of these rural areas. Um, you know, water transfers, water rights. 
uh, are featured prominently as well. One of the ones I wanted to highlight in this slide is um, the, the possibility of wastewater reuse. And that is, um, you know, a strategy that's, that's uh, very well developed in places like California, um, a little, you know, fair amount in Texas, to be honest, um, but is just, just getting off the ground as a, a legitimate and feasible water management strategy uh, in Oklahoma. So two or three individuals or individual water providers have identified that as a realistic strategy. Now, this wouldn't be for potable reuse of water. This would be to water ball fields and parks and things like that. But it seems like a sensible use of a uh, water supply that, that's already out there. One of the activities we spent a fair amount of time discussing with stakeholders and, and then, uh, you know, sharpening our pencils and scribbling our notepads on is, is, you know, how do you quantify drought? And drought means different things to different people. Some view it strictly as a lake level thing and, and what's underground they can't see, so they're not concerned about that. But for some folks that rely on the aquifer, the drought is really... Um, quantified or um, you know, indicated by uh, levels in the aquifer, which of course are easy to measure if you've got a drought uh, or a well monitoring system in place. But you know, stream flow and streams are running low, soil moisture um, is a good one as well, flow from springs, uh, lack of rain, temperatures, high temperatures uh, can indicate a, a bad drought conditions. Um, but there's a lot of different ways to quantify drought. And there's lots, lots frankly, a lot of diff different definitions of drought out there, um, as you all know. Uh, you know, hydrologic drought, meteorologic drought, agricultural drought are all slightly drift, uh, different. And, and determining when a particular region is in drought um, is, uh, uh, you know, is a source of, source of argument in some cases. Um, so for us, we decided that all of those things are important. So we wanted to develop a composite uh, drought index. So lake levels in, in, in Arbuckle Lake are important. And this graph that I'm showing on the screen right now shows what was happening during this time. The, the uh, Arbuckle Lake was impounded in the late 60s and uh, lake levels stayed more or less constant, constant through the next you know, five decades, some flood events, but the water levels never really came down until 2010, 2011, into 2013 um, and beyond. And then lake levels were as low as anyone had seen and people were worried about how much lower those lake levels would go. And then of course we had a deluge of, of rainfall and, and we went from having the lowest lake levels ever seen to the highest lake levels ever seen uh, within a couple of months. But our Buckle Lake seems to be a good indicator of drought um, throughout the region. But you know, we're studying the Arbuckle Simpson, and ultimately that's what's important uh, to the region, and, and indirectly or directly, that's what everyone is uh, looking to uh, for their water supply. So having a monitoring well would seem to be a good idea as well, and there's a, a USGS monitors the a, a, a well that uh, fits you. That little figure shows the, the, the center of town that fits you. This is a very rural area, and um, um, but there's a monitoring well here that helps us keep track of aquifer levels. Springs are very important uh, to the region and uh, Antelope Springs is, is right there in the middle of the National Recreational Area. We've got good information on that spring as far as flows. And, you know, historically that spring has, has occasionally run dry or run, run dry for a short period of time uh, every two or three years. But at the beginning of this drought, the aquifer, or sorry, the spring ran dry and stayed dry for a long period of time. And that was a big concern to folks. The Blue River is a, is a, is, is a very, very important feature uh, in the region for water suppliers, but as well as the recreational industry. And there's two figures there. I hope you can see them um, as well as I can see them with my glasses on. But um, it's a flashy river, uh, but it's spring fed. So there's a, there's a strong, uh, base flow uh, in the river. And um, that base flow sustains uh, primarily Durant community downstream, but also uh, uh, sustains a fish hatchery and sustains a 
uh, uh, fishery and trout fishery downstream as well. So it's a very important river. And of course, what a lot of people do just because it's easy to do is look at something like the uh, Palmer Drought Severity Index uh, put out by NOAA, which tracks using uh, meteorological data, um, uh, essentially a drought index for the region. And when, when those numbers get down to minus two, uh, we, we call that a moderate drought. Uh, when they get down to you know, three or lower, then that's a severe drought. And then when you get down below four, that's a pretty extreme drought situation. And like I was discussing earlier in my presentation, uh, we've only had that extreme drought situation uh, three or four times over the last century. So this composite drought index um, is based on all five of those active monitoring stations, lake levels, groundwater levels, spring flow, uh, PDSI, uh, and then river flow in the Blue River. And what we did is identify two levels of drought, a stage one drought, we called it, and a stage two drought. And those droughts are triggered, stage one is triggered when any of those thresholds, which are shown on the, on the lower left side um, of that slide, any of those thresholds are reached, we call for a stage one drought. And when all five of those thresholds uh, are exceeded, then we are calling for a stage two drought. And we played around with those thresholds, of course, to make sure that we were sensible with them and then also ran historical data through this algorithm to see what those particular thresholds and those stages looked like on historical data. So, um, you know, going back to 2005, which is when we had data for all of these sites, sites on a continuous basis, there were stage one was triggered just a couple of times for a short period of time until the drought that started uh, at the end of 2010. So stage one was triggered earlier. I'm looking at the figure uh, in the middle of the slide now, blue being stage one and orange being stage two. So as you'd expect, you get stage one triggered first and as the drought gets more severe, then you can trigger stage two. Uh, and then occasionally you have some rainfall or some respite and you're out of drought for a short period of time. But in this case, we went back to stage one and then stage two drought um, pretty rapidly thereafter. And then stage one drought came back in 2013 and then stayed with us until early 2015, uh, again, when we had very heavy rainfall for an extended period of time uh, throughout the region. But probably the most interesting um, activity that the any of these drought contingency plan uh, planners get involved in is the development of those strategies. You know, how are we going to uh, mitigate future drought? What are those uh, response actions and those mitigation actions that we're going to develop? Um, so on the, in the near term, uh, we formalize the task force. Those folks have all been uh, identified and have agreed to participate in regular meetings and do updates. Um, we wanted to develop a, uh, a good ongoing relationship with all of the water providers in particular to help them with implementation of both response actions, but also the longer term mitigation actions, which we've done. Um, we also wanted to help uh, identify those mitigation actions, whether they're involve infrastructure or policy or research or, or other activities that maybe require funding, maybe require technical support. We wanted to help those folks implement those uh, drought mitigation projects, which we've done as well. And I can provide some examples later if we'd like. Um, and then we developed, as I mentioned in the previous slides, this drought monitoring system with individual triggers based on those monitoring stations. And uh, I think I've got a slide that shows that later, but we send out a daily email to everyone who participated in this drought uh, contingency plan activities letting them know the status of the drought. Midterm activities, uh, again, involve uh, implementation of mitigation and response projects, but ones that um, are gonna take a little bit longer to implement. Some of those bigger infrastructure projects, for example, uh, looking for uh, alternative uh, or supplemental water supplies, for example, interconnections with other 
rural water districts and water providers is one of the ideas that came up that, that gained a lot of traction through this effort. So for example, if one community has a well that's gone dry, uh, their ability to get water from an adjacent rural water district or city, um, those types of activities have been implemented as a result of these uh, conversations. Uh, things like leak detection, water, uh, water use audits, um, training activities have also taken place as a result of this. Uh, some communities have developed uh, concept drought conservation or uh, drought education plans, which is great. Um, and we've worked with, I say we, the Choctaw and Chickasaw Nations have worked with many of these water providers on specific um, action plans as a result of this. Um, you know, one of the things that is a struggle, particularly in these rural areas, is that they don't know where water lines are, which makes it hard to uh, do sort of leak detection uh, and repair programs, of course, but it just makes them hard to manage. It makes it hard for them to manage their system. They don't have hydraulic models. They don't have GIS maps. They don't know um, how to make interconnections um, because they don't know where those water lines are. So some of these communities um, have received funding to uh, develop uh, digital maps of their distribution system, including uh, pipe material and pipe diameters, which is which is great. That was already ongoing through the state previously, but that has um, accelerated through this activity. Um, you know, bringing all of those folks uh, together really fostered a good dialogue between them, and there's been a lot of sidebar conversations and and sort of peripheral activities that have taken place as a result of this, um, you know, one of which relates to water quality and monitoring bacteria and nutrients, which Lake of the Arbuckles has a, a, an issue with that we're trying to address as well. So on those longer term uh, strategies, I mentioned reuse before, um, there's talk about desalination, the Red River, which flows to the south of this region, um, has uh, total dissolved solids that are too, too high for potable drinking water. Um, so there's been conversation. That's a huge source of water, by the way. Lake Texoma is one of the biggest lakes in the region. Um, but there's a, a possibility of reducing pressure on the Arbuckle Simpson through desalinating uh, water from the Red River. Um, better monitoring um, of the aquifer um, is, is coming about as well. We've got uh, uh, additional mapping of springs and monitoring of springs that have come out, that has come about because of this. Um, there's a really uh, interesting activity, and the reason I was in uh, Oklahoma earlier this week um, related to uh, water marketing and, and water banks. So this is actually another project that was funded by the Bureau of Reclamation. But there is a need because of the implementation of Senate Bill 288. There is a need for the buying and selling of water rights so that water providers have sufficient water rights or assist, assist sufficient dedicated lands in order to pump water out of uh, existing and future wells. So we've been speaking with a lot of the same communities about setting up a water bank or at least facilitating the buying and selling um, of water rights between parties. I think the Chickasaw Nation is likely gonna take that on as a long-term activity. Um, In-stream flows and environmental flows, the states, the state of Oklahoma and the tribes have got together and they're investigating that further. We've got a couple of ongoing activities uh, related to that. Um, looking at the, initially looking at the value, uh, a numerical value in dollars of the Blue River as a starting point. What benefits beyond water supply does the river bring to the region? That's a pretty interesting activity that's come about directly uh, as a result of this drought contingency plan. And then uh, um, lots and lots of um, uh, activities on in the watershed uh, uh, related to improving soil health and improving the quality of the aquifer to improve the quantity and quality of water and Lake of the Air buckles and the streams that, that feed it. Um, you know, controlled burns, uh, ranching, uh, improved ranching activities to again, improve soil health and improve the quality of the watershed. 
We haven't, to be honest, um, looked at the feasibility of building new reservoirs. Um, that's not something that um, was, uh, that's an expensive endeavor, shall I say. What I will say though is Durant is, um, has funded uh, through its partners, the investigation of the use of Lake Durant, which had not been used for water supply in a long time, integrating that back into their system of water supply in a more effective way, effective and efficient way. Uh, we've also um, kicked off a second phase of the Arbuckle Simpson Aquifer study. And that process um, is being facilitated, facilitated by uh, the OCA Institute at East Central University. So y'all may have seen, hopefully you've seen a, or been provided a link to the drought contingency plan uh, itself. Uh, it's 100 and something, 197 pages, I think. So don't print it out, but uh, downloading a digital copy, uh, there's a lot of good information, much more than what I was able to present in this uh, presentation. Um, and that uh, uh, report is also available um, at East Central University at the Yoka Institute. Yoka is the Chickasaw word for water, and they have a little water department there that was actively involved in the process of uh, developing this drought contingency plan, and they continue to host both the drought contingency plan and workshops related to that. They also facilitate the uh, Arbuckle Simpson Aquifer Phase Two uh, activities, um, which is, uh, uh, gosh, I could speak for half an hour about that as well. Um, but we're fortunate to have East Central University as a partner um, in all of this. As a result of the draft contingency plan, we also sent out um, uh, we send out a daily email that shows the status of the drought. So those five drought monitoring stations uh, are reporting in real time. That information is brought into a computer here at Aqua Strategies and we determine what stage of drought it is and then send an email out to everyone so they can see the status of the, status of the drought um, and, and uh, also what those monitoring stations are all seeing. So right now we're in a pretty good shape, no drought. Um, good flows out of Antelope Springs, um, good lake levels, PDSI is positive um, instead of negative. So um, yeah, I think, I think with that, I am gonna close my presentation to give folks enough time to ask questions. Like I said, there's an awful lot more material in the drought contingency plan than I put in my presentation. But um, as I was saying, uh, with the folks hosting this uh, before my presentation, there's an awful lot of activities that have come about because of those stakeholder meetings, because of bringing together those people that have a, a vested interest in the aquifer and the water that it provides, the benefits that it provides to the region. And the Chickasaw Nation in particular has been very proactive working with water providers, ranchers, uh, industry, towns, um, farmers on, um, if not directly implementing the strategies laid out in the plan, at least working with them on water related activities to help the whole region uh, remain sustainable and uh, economically viable and just a great place to live. So with that, I'll wrap up and uh, happy to answer any questions. Thanks so much, Barney, for such a wonderful presentation. Um, really, really cool to see all of the actions that you all came up with um, and you know, coming up with your own your own drought index and all of that stuff is super interesting. Um, I, I suddenly thought that my heart jumped into my throat because I thought I'd suddenly spoken for 45 minutes on mute. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's the danger of Zoom, right? But uh, I know. I, I didn't. So good. I'm glad you heard it. I just feel like you're speaking into the abyss. I understand. Um, <laughs> yeah, we're we're a pretty small group today. So if anybody, um, you know, I have a couple questions I could ask, but if anybody has questions, uh, please feel free to unmute yourself, drop questions in the chat, anything like that.
maybe this is a good time to ask uh, April uh, or Shalem if they have anything to add as well. They were both involved in this process and have, have uh, helped the Chickasaw Nation with some of the implementation strategies. And like I mentioned, this, this drought contingency plan has been a great springboard into other uh, planning activities, but has also helped facilitate bringing in other federal funds, not only from the uh, Bureau of Reclamation, but from others to show that, hey, we know what we're doing with water, we know what the goal is, and, um, you know, help us implement these strategies. So that's, it's been super beneficial. But April's with the uh, South Central Climate Science Center. She's a Chickasaw Nation representative, and she's just turned her video on, so I'm guessing she has something uh, interesting to say. Hi everyone, um, I'm April Taylor. I'm a tribal liaison for the South Central Climate Adaptation Science Center. Um, and I would just say, um, you know, the, for a tribe to lead a really innovative tribal um, and the tribes to be involved in this drought plan has been um, really cool to see and um, for them to be so involved in their communities and really leading um, that community engagement as Barney was talking about um, throughout their jurisdictions, uh, I think is one of the coolest things of this for me um, and encouraging stakeholders to engage with their tribes in their jurisdictions and in their regions um, is um, I think one cool aspect of this that you don't see a lot of that um, when drought planning is happening especially when drought plans happen at a state level. And so including your, your tribal colleagues is, um, is really important, at least here in Oklahoma. Um, and then another thing that I would just say from a, a climate perspective, I think we've learned a lot through this process about um, drought and how with, with climate change as climate will continue to increase and um, could potentially change the intensity and frequency of droughts in our region. Um, and so getting a grasp of how these things um, affect, you know, the aquifer is going to be really important um, for future water and um, in these areas and, and how these communities respond. Um, and so getting them to think about, as Barney talks about, that sort of landscape across the jurisdiction. So it's not one community for one community. All these communities rely on this water source on this aquifer. And so that's a really, for me, innovative approach as well um, to get that kind of buy-in and stakeholder engagement across the landscape, um, and which is gonna be needed to, because climate change and drought, as we all know, doesn't just impact one community or one um, water source. And so thinking about how our impacts across the landscape um, affect other communities is what. So those are just I was some things that I thought I'd comment on that make this a really unique and cool project for me. So. Yeah, thanks, April. I really appreciate that. Um, Other questions or thoughts to share? This is a small enough group for yeah, any thoughts or discussion as well. Oh, one question from Amy. Thanks, Amy. Um, April, are there any challenges you see in terms of implementing the plan? I would actually ask Barney that. If Barney, you have any challenges in implementation? Yeah, I, I, I thought that question might come up when we were uh, when I was midway through my presentation. <laughs> I think. I think what's happened is that um, we were planning to get together as a task force on a regular basis, right? And kind of revisit the drought contingency plan, revisit the monitoring, you know, the setting of trees. Instead, I think what's happened is the Chickasaw Nation and the Choctaw Nations have continued the dialogue with those individual landowners and water providers kind of on a one-on-one -on -one basis. So we haven't got together as a group again um, to do the sort of, you know, a drought contingency plan next steps thing. Um, I think 
I think the drought contingency plan itself has been an overwhelming success. It's brought folks together. They all realize we're in this together. You know, it's a sole source aquifer for many people. Um, you know, they've agreed on response actions. They've, they've developed a lot of their own mitigation activities. In some instances, they've agreed to work together to share water during dry conditions, that kind of stuff, which is exactly what you'd want um, out of this process. But like I said, you know, this was, this was published gosh, almost five years ago, and we haven't met together as a group again. And part of that is because we've had wet weather since that time, so we really haven't had a drought. But I think mainly it's because we are meeting individually with each of those water providers and providing technical support and financial support and sometimes helping them attract federal funds or others. So um, the implementation hasn't been quite what I thought it would be, after the plan, in some respects, it's been more successful. In some respects, it's been, maybe I should say, not unsuccessful, just different than I was anticipating. I would just add what Barney was saying. You know, we haven't had those sort of droughts to really implement yet um, to see if those are good thresholds or if those are good actions and if people are willing to actually do those things in, in the situation of a a drought and, and we haven't had it tested, right? We haven't had a, an intense uh, drought like we had in 2011, 2012. And so, um, you know, a lot of people ask us about success, but until it sort of get some of that on um, and see, and then ask us in a few years, <laughs> basically. <laughs> and so we'll get back to that to see if, if it's, if those are good decisions. So. In a weird positive place that we all haven't been dealing with bad drought, which is great, but you haven't been able to see what the drought contingency planning can really do. Totally. Yeah. Hey, I saw a good question from John Nielsen Gammon, our state, state climatologist here in Texas. Um, and he's asking, in what ways did the involvement of the Chickasaw Nation make the, make the drought planning process different, uh, say, from aqu aquifer planning in Texas, which is a great question. Um, one of the things I think, uh, and I think I mentioned this in one of my slides that made it easy to bring all of these folks together in, uh, in Oklahoma by the Chickasaw Nation is we don't have, I say we, I keep, one of these days I'm going to become Chickasaw, an honorary Chickasaw member, I think, but the, they're not a regulatory entity. So there's nothing the Chickasaw Nation is going to do that's going to require you know, City of Sulphur, City of Tishomingo, or Rural Water District to do something. So in a sense, we're a neutral party um, inviting folks to the table to talk about their issues and find solutions. And I think if the state were to do that, or the feds in particular, um, I think some of those folks um, would have been reluctant to come to the table and certainly reluctant to share some of their concerns or issues partly because their, their concerns might be regulatory in nature or partly because they fear they're close to being um, not compliant with things. Um, so I think the fact that it was the Chickasaw Nation doing this made everyone much more uh, open and collaborative. Um, I'm not saying that this couldn't be done in Texas. I think it absolutely could, but you'd need to think carefully about who was facilitating, who was doing the hosting, who was developing that drought contingency plan. And, and in Texas, similar to Oklahoma, I think you'd get people at the table if they understood clearly that this wasn't gonna be a new regulation on them. And I think it helps for them to be a, a, a very much a neutral party. So not a water right holder, not a groundwater conservation district, but some sort of neutral party that is obviously trying to help stakeholders in the region. Would say you know obviously the money so the you know the tribe was a huge um, part of the grant proposal to bring this in right and so um, and sort of taking that lead to do something across the landscape or that collaboration and so um, they are going after these grants and helping these communities to bring in those funding um, that some of these communities don't have that capacity to or the means to go after funding. Yeah, there's matching funds. I forgot about that. So that's a big part Quite of it. Quite a bit of funds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But John, I think there are some opportunities in Texas, and I'm thinking particularly in the Brazos Basin, um, you know, bringing uh, agricultural water users together with 
municipal water providers. Um, I know there was in this same drought period of time, um, some real antagonism that um, occurred as a result of tight water resources and the TCQ I think didn't help in that process, but uh, there was a subsequent finding against the TCQ and there needs to be some sort of follow-up. What happens in a drought condition when people who thought they had 100% reliable supply don't have that water available to them or even some of the more junior water providers, uh, you know, how do they firm up their water supply during drought conditions? And I, and I think uh, sort of a neutral third party, I'm not suggesting the Chickasaw Nation come down to Texas to do that, but some sort of neutral third party in Texas facilitating a drought contingency plan in the Brazos would be, would be a really good thing. Yeah, thanks for those comments. And also going back to what April mentioned, I've seen a need in Texas and I'm sure other states for the smaller towns and so forth who don't have the capacity to go out and and develop proposals for grants like this there could be a neutral third party that brings them together and 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 develops a, a mechanism by which they can obtain funding and go through this process collectively absolutely i was going to ask barney um so obviously we have a very hot summer going on a hot <laughs> time going on right now are you guys um getting you know any sort of feedback on how the aquifer's doing in in these hot summers and and that response or? you mean right now in oklahoma over yeah, the yeah yeah you know the aquifer is not in that bad shape um let me see are, are y'all seeing my screen we see uh, questions Okay, uh, let's see. Yeah, can you see, can you see that? Can you see my slide? Mm -hmm. So Antelope Springs uh, right now is flowing at about two CFS, the triggers at a half a CFS. And, and then in that figure that I showed you, you know, the aquifer uh, where the spring often ran dry. So every two or three years it ran dry. So we're nowhere near running dry right now. Blue River is, is uh, flowing twice as high as the trigger level. Um, the, and this is uh, feet below surface. So we're 15 feet above uh, on the monitoring well. Lake of the Arbuckles is five feet below or five feet above trigger there. And, and PDSI is at two almost. So, um, you know, relative to the drought of 2010 to 2015, we're in really good shape. Um, so it always feels like we're in a drought at the end of August, but um, you know, <laughs> feels like it's hotter than it's ever been. But of course, it was like that last year as well. So, all right, thank you. Yeah, thank you both uh, so much, and thank you, April, for hopping on and answering questions and giving your comments as well. Um, I think I'm going to pass it off to Dina to wrap this up for us. Thanks, thanks, Anna. Um, thanks, Barney, and thank you, April, for all that great information. Um, and like you said, Barney, there could be several more webinars off just what you presented to us today. So um, thank you for taking the time to sharing all that with us. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, this webinar was recorded and will be made available on the CCAST YouTube channel. Uh, where you can find all our previous webinars to share with colleagues um, if they couldn't make it today. If you enjoy learning from these case studies, I also encourage you to visit the CCAS website and the case study dashboard where we currently have 122 case studies on different topics. And um, Anna, if you could drop that info in the chat for me, that would be great, thank you. Um, and so we are working on lining up webinar speakers on drought issues in the coming months. Um, if you would like to get these webinar announcements and you haven't, please feel free to reach out to us. And if you have some work on drought that you are interested in sharing on our platform, also reach out to us and we'd be happy to work with you. Um, again, we thank you for your time and thank you, Barney, for joining us and giving this great presentation and we hope you have a great day. Thank you.
Thank you. Bye-bye.